So let me ask you this. Do you, do you still stay pretty involved with the USC football program? You know, not as much as I'd like, um, partly because family, kids, sports. I mean, you only have so much time in life. Now, I love when I can sit down and watch a game, which is few and far between. Always rooting for them. If I can, if I can make the goal once a year, I think at the beginning of the year when I, when I set like the goals for the year, it's make one USC football game. But um, I guess uh, the good thing is my kids' uh, Pop Warner teams continue to advance and win so that means our saturdays are occupied hopefully through the rest of november so uh yeah we'd like to go um not nothing of the plans and wish i was more involved but someday yeah so you know that's an interesting i i, I wanted to ask you this question and and uh you know as an ex-football player uh, you know, I, I have this conversation a lot and, and I'm asked frequently. So I have two daughters and my daughters are involved in, in softball and volleyball and those sports. But, you know, football and, and especially tackle football is never really an option. But I'm asked quite often, you know, if I have sons, if I had boys, would I let them play football? Right. With a lot of the concussion stuff that's that's occurring and some of those different things that are out there. I, I know your uh, your oldest is playing. I, I, I believe your uh, your youngest plays as well. What are your thoughts on that? That's a really good question. I think one parent told me last year or maybe two years ago when we first got our boys. And so this is our third year. Last year was a COVID year, so they didn't get to play. Um, but we were kind of hesitant, like most people, maybe hold our kids out. And, and we were on the fence. Our kids really wanted to play. And one parent that we uh, were on the baseball team with said, you know, would you rather your kids learn the fundamentals and how to play and how to tackle now when the hits don't mean as much versus not playing and putting your kids when all the other kids have had years of experience are bigger, faster, stronger, the hits are going to mean more. So for us, it made a whole lot of sense. Like, let's teach our kids the game now and then versus holding them back and trying to learn when everybody's ahead of you and then they're not going to know how to do those things. So for us, it was a no-brainer. It was actually safer for our kids to put them in early and learn the game than try to hold out until, you know, like, like I said, until injured, they're, they're more injury prone by not knowing the game at that time. Yeah, and no, I agree with that. And the game really is so much safer than it was when we played. Uh, I think they've really done a good job with with sort of the the fundamentals of how to tackle the helmet to helmet, you know, not just sticking your head into everything on every play all the time, you know, protecting people. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I remember, you know, in high school and I'm sure you do, too, you know, watching these, you know, videos where it was it was just the biggest hits possible. And it was, you know, 30 minutes of safeties taking out wide receivers coming across the middle with helmet to helmet hits. And it was like, Oh, look at that guy's completely knocked out cold. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, uh, you just don't see that as much anymore. I think it, I think it really helps protect the players. Yeah, it does. And the rules are a little bit different too. Like the uh, younger kids up until I think like maybe seventh grade are in a two point stance. So they're not three, you know, they're not, they don't have their hand down on the ground. It's to, to reduce impact. So, I mean, we're, we're part of it. We're in it. We're in the thick of it. We love it. We wouldn't have any other way. Big commitment, but, you know, it's just a short time, short period of time in our lives. Yeah. You, you know, when I get asked that question, I always say I would allow my kids to play because I think the, the lessons I learned playing football, the, you know, the perseverance, the work ethic, the camaraderie. Uh, you know, it's really why I started this podcast in the first place, because I, I think that there's so many things that are developed in sports and especially team sports that translate to your adult life and, and help you be successful in, in, in whatever path you go down. So, yes, there's there's risk of injury. There, there's no doubt about it and, and potential risk of serious injury. And I think that occurs in all sports. But when I look at the positives that came out of my experiences playing sports i think they they far outweigh the risks of, of those injuries you know you bring up a good point um and i've had a lot of thinking about this you know you look in life today like how do you give our kids the uh a little bit of the upbringing that we had it was a different time it's a different world today and you kind of look around these kids at the end of each night these 23 little kids looking up at you and you're thinking God, what's the best way I can teach these kids to be men today? You know, what's the most I can get away from the everyone deserves a trophy culture to just, you know, making these feel, you know, one, they're going to learn about teammates, learn how to get along with everybody, um, learning the hierarchy of a coach, which is like a boss. 
Um, learning how to be tough, like, you know, how to, when you're hurt, you get back up and keep going, you know, obviously with, with reason and, and whatnot. But um, I just look around, like, what a better way to train our young men to be men, kind of in a similar fashion, maybe that we were the raised. And I think that kind of we're going to a society that, um, you know, nobody wants their feelings to be hurt. Um, certainly that's not the case of what we, we don't want that to happen either. But I just think it's, it's really teaching kids how to be tough, stick up for themselves, when you get pushed down, get back up, be able to listen to coach. Yes, sir. You know, uh, you know, if you're, if you're on time, you're late. If you, if you, if you're, uh, if, if you're early, you're on time attitude. So we, we've just seen, you know, we've got a great group of kids um, and everyone is respectful. And it's just one of those things that just understood. And the good thing is the parents kind of follow suit with that. So it's just a great, I, I couldn't recommend it more for someone who's just kind of trying to help mold their kid into being a responsible you know, young man. So let's take a step back. Uh, what sports did you play in high school? High school. So I, I ran track and I played football. Obviously, uh, football, you ended up uh, getting an opportunity to go to USC, one of the most prestigious universities in the country. Uh, where, where else were you recruited? What, what, what other options did you have? Yeah. You know, I was one of those kids that kind of a late bloomer. So, you know, I, I didn't really grow a ton till my senior year. I think I, you know, I, I grew about two or three inches between junior and senior year, put on 20 pounds. Um, so junior year wasn't looking that good. And then senior year had a great senior year. Um, and there was a few prospects, I think like uh, some great schools, you know, uh, Idaho, San Jose State, a few other people kind of looking around at me and, had an opportunity to, to, to go on there and it would have been a great opportunity. But, you know, I, I always had this dream. I wanted to play at, at USC. So I, um, I went to junior college, took every class that could be transferable there and took a chance. And, you know, I was just really lucky to be, you know, coached and mentored by, you know, uh, a guy named Gene Murphy who kind of helped pave the way of, of really getting in there. And some, some luck fell in line. Um, I was a long snapper and tight end. It just so happens the punter on the team went to my high school, and he knew I could snap. They also had a they also had a um, a tight end at the time that left the team, so I was a tight end and long snapper. Suddenly there was a need for both, and I played one year to JC, and then I was I was lucky enough to actually get that opportunity to get a full scholarship to USC. At that time, there was a, a few other colleges that. You know, had had showed some interest after the JC, and I would have loved to have gone to those, but the dream came true, and you know, kind of that's part of the life story that I have. It's amazing. So, so, I, I, so I, I, I didn't even I, realize I didn't that about you. So you actually, you, actually, you, you, you had, opportunities had opportunities to go, to go D1, D1 out, of out of high school, school bet on yourself, bet on yourself chose, to chose to go to a junior, to a junior college, college instead, instead played, played a season, played a season there, and then had an opportunity, opportunity to go to USC. You know, yeah, it's one of those things where you know just. I, I felt I could do more, and I, I you know, I, I took that year and just got bigger, faster, stronger, and kind of just, kind of came into my own. Um, and I had a, a guy, I think I mentioned Gene Murphy, which is just a unbelievable coach at that level. And I remember him calling me one day after spring ball after our first year there, and I was just, I was poised to have just a great year. I was excited going into that. I was going to go one more year at the JC and then, and then hope to get transferred on. And um, he called me up one day and said, hey, if you could leave early from the JC, would you? And of course, yeah, I would. So he kind of sacrificed his own team. Obviously, with me being on that team, we could have been better. And said, all right, well, you know, here's the schools that are interested in you. And he mentioned, you know, a couple of great schools I would love to have gone to. Um, that was, you know, in my mind, something that I, I was, would, would it made sense from not taking that, that ride in high school, betting on myself. I think one was Northwestern, one was Arizona, one was Utah. Um, and a few other that were calling and I thought that, that was fantastic. So he said, would you want to go to any of these schools? And I said, God, yeah, I would, Coach. Um, but man, did uh, SC didn't call, huh? And then he said, Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, they called too. So you know, and, and I said, he said, Do you want to go there? And I said, Yeah, I, I do, absolutely, it's my dream. He said, Okay, let me make a call. I'll, I'll call you back. 
So the next call I got was John Robinson calling and saying, we want you to come down tomorrow, bring your parents, we're gonna offer you a full ride. Um, he and my parents got a private tour of the school, went to the bookstore, bought it, bought the sweatshirt, did the whole deal, and, th and that was it. So it's kind of like life just taking me down a journey that, um, you know, kind of, I guess, I, I meant to be. So got a little luck, Me meets opportunity there. What was your, like, welcome to big-time football moment? Do you, did you have that moment where you, you came on campus, there was a teammate, the first day of practice, that you're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 no, I'm not in Kansas anymore? <laughs> I think we all felt that way. Um, yeah, you know, two moments, I would say, yeah, when I, when I first got on there, and then you see the team, and, you know, I, I just, I'd, I'd never seen people that big in my entire life. Uh, you know, where I had come from, I was kind of the big guy or the fast guy, and, and you look around, and everybody was the best at wherever they went, and, and, and the people, the linemen were bigger people than I ever, I didn't know these people existed. I'd never seen people that big, and they were just from all over the country. So then, then what's funny is you, you get used to being around people that big, and, and, you know, and every day in practice, you're pushing around people that big. So you kind of just live in that world. But I think the biggest kind of welcome to college football is the first game we played against um, Florida State. And this is at the time when they were winning national championships. And so we were backed up at SC's one yard line for a punt. And that was the first snap. So I played long snapper and I was a tight end. So I snapped out of the one yard line against Florida State with 90,000 people. So that was pretty nerve wracking. We punned, I think, 10 times in that game. So, um, yeah, it was kind of welcome to college football. Yeah. You, you know, one of the things, you know, I, I, I think was so great about high level sports and elite sports. Uh, and, you know, once again, one of the reasons why I really wanted to start this is when you get to that level and, and, and I'm sure it just continues to accelerate as you move up to the professional ranks, et cetera there is no more, nothing is entitled at that point, right? You, you step on a campus, you got a scholarship, they took a chance on you, but everybody else out there is talented. They're good. They're all working hard. They all want to start. They all want to be the best. And if you're not willing to put in that work yourself, if you're not willing to compete on a day in day out basis, someone's going to beat you out. And, and, and the, the reality of it is, the coaches, like, yeah, they want you to be successful, but they're more concerned about the team being successful. And it's so easy to be left behind if you don't have that competitive drive and that work ethic. And, and I think that those things carry over so well into the professional world. Right. No, it, it, you're right. It, it, it is a business. It's their business, a business of winning, the, you know, um, and, uh, you know, if you're not performing, trust me, you, you, you know about it, but yeah, it's, it's de definitely the, the one thing I think the wide opening thing was coming from an area where the demographic where I grew up was one thing. And then walking into a hundred different people from every walk of life um, and just, wow, just seeing the stories from some people from, from the farm in the Midwest, some people were from the ghetto and, you know, had children to support. And then here I am coming from, you know, kind of a, you know, a, South Orange County neighborhood. It was just definitely, definitely a, a eye-opening experience. Who was the teammate that pushed you the most? That you know, you just felt like on a day in day out basis, you just had to keep up with this person. <laughs> you know, I would say the God. There's, there's so many um, throughout the course of the years. Uh, I, I probably would go back to my high school years and say, you know, one of my best friends, his name is Brian Forth. And, you know, he was just a guy that, um, he ended up playing full ride at, at Arizona State, but a white guy that was probably 5'10", you know, 170 pounds. But just the hardest working guy you ever met and the work ethic. And yeah, I think it, you know, in, our, our, in high school, his mom had passed away and dedicated his senior, or dedicated his year towards her. And he was, you know, all county and just this unbelievable guy. So just kind of seeing the way his approach of just excellence, working hard. I know you probably played with guys like that. Sort of just took that sport and anything you do to the, to the, you know, to the to the best of your ability. So I'd say that was one of many that um, throughout my my time. But just like like the football team is just like at work. You know, there's some people that dedicate their craft to what they're doing and take it to the, to, to the best they could possibly be. And, you know, I, 
I, I know it made me better. So sports ends for everybody eventually, except uh, maybe Tom Brady, who will, who will play forever. But uh, how, how, did, how did you know it was done for you? Uh, well, the last, the last game at SC, I was a senior. Um, you know, they, they were, were beaten, I think, I don't know, I think it was like Eastern Louisiana or something. And uh, the coach was putting all the players in, you know, all the seniors and, you know, and playing long snapper, I, I did play tight end, but it was a more limited role because you get the long snapper, it gets hurt, you don't have a kicking game. So, yeah, you know, I got yeah, I was I was in there playing a few reps and just you know realizing you know as soon as that time clicked off, I walked off the field to miss the last time I would play. Um, I, I had an agent at the time that you know after there you could snap on the pros and play some tight end. You're a fast guy. But I think I've been playing since I was a little kid. I was tired. I was burnt out. Um, and looking back now, I think like playing in Europe or something would have been fun. Or maybe someone would have taken a shot on me as as a backup tight end snapper. Had I when I the next day I walked out the field, hit the gym, you know, worked everything I you know put on some weight, did everything I could. Yeah, I, I think there would have been an opportunity. But for me, my life at that time just I, I was ready to I was ready to do something else. And now I'm the old dad on the on the football field telling the kids, man, what we wouldn't do to to, to, to be in your shoes one last time. The same thing we heard when we were kids. So I was ready for it when I was done. And as time has progressed, I I, I, I miss it, and I wish I had that that back. Did you know what you wanted to do professionally? right when you finished was, you know, getting into the, the commercial real estate side of things, uh, something that you had thought about in college or, or how, how did that opportunity first present itself to you? I oh, that's, that's a great question, Greg. Um, I think out of college, I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time. It was a dot com, but the dot coms were the, were the hottest new fad and I wanted to be in technology. So my brother was involved in technology. I, I had a, career fair at USC, I saw a company called Aero Electronics, you know, this big electronic d distributor. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. And so I, I got paid 37.5 my first year out. And man, I just, I didn't like it at all. I, 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 it's my mind didn't work that way. I wasn't an electronical guy. I wasn't an engineer type. Um, in my, you know, I kind of, during that year, long story short, I actually came down with leukemia um, and it, it forced me to be in a hospital for pretty much the next year after that. So a year after football, I had a job I didn't like and it wasn't fit for me. And then I came down with leukemia, lo and behold, and I was about a year in a hospital. And you know, during that recovery time, I just started soul searching what I want to do. And when I did get out of the hospital and I couldn't go back to work yet, I would drive around. I mean, you know, I couldn't be out in public, so I'd drive around the mat. Well, I had to wear a mask on wherever I went. And real estate started kind of on the up and up, the early 2000s. And I'd drive around the beach cities and I'd see all these beautiful places and people making money. And um, went to a wedding and I, I, I sat in the back of a boat with one of my friend's dads who had made it. I mean, this guy had had a house on Newport Harbor and I said, what do, what do I need to do? And he said, save up enough money to uh, instead of a home, buy a duplex, live in one, rent out the other. Let that go up in value, refinance, buy another one. Let that go up in value, refinance, buy another one. So the next day I called my brother up and said, hey, I've got a little bit of money, you've got a little bit of money, let's buy a duplex. So we bought a duplex and then we did that. We bought a, we bought a triplex and then we bought a house. And so it, it was working. And, um, and that's when I knew that I like this. This is fun. I, I enjoy the real estate aspect of it. So that's how I knew I, I wanted to get into real estate. So, I mean, you just mentioned something, you know, really powerful. Uh, you went through a bout of leukemia uh, obviously you, 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 you got through it. I know you've been healthy for, for, for a number of years since. Did that significantly change your mindset and the way you approached life? You know, it did. Um, so I got sick and uh, at first I didn't know what it was. I thought it was the flu. And the, the doctor said, call up your parents. Um, you know, I said, why? 
why, why would I call my parents? And now I think they should come down. And so they came in the room and they said, we think you have leukemia. And it was like, shock. And uh, we need to prepare you for chemo. And so, I mean, at that point, I just, I had, didn't even know that I had this. And then they're wheeling in, you know, chemo and, or, you know, the, the IV bags for chemo. And, and um, you know, just kind of, kind of broke down and cried. And, and then, then when the dust settled, I just said, okay, what do we, what do we have? And, and they, they diagnosed the type of rare type of African-based leukemia. And they said that you have, there's, first off, there's a 50% chance you're not going to make it. And then if you do make it, then you have the opportunity to um, do a bone marrow transplant. And then if you do a bone marrow transplant, we have to find somebody that's an equal match for you. And if, and, and if, you, do, if you find that, there's a one in five chance you're not going to make it from that. And so, I mean, it was kind of, the, the odds were against me, but I, I, I mean, what, a, what other choice did I have? So at the time, Lance Armstrong was, had recovered from cancer. So my mom bought me the book, Beyond the Bike. I was too sick to read it. So she read to me every night and I just felt like, this guy treated it like a sport. And if I could treat this like a sport, so I was like, all right, doctor, what do I, what's everything I need to do? What food do I need to eat? What do I need to do? How much exercise do I need to do? Like just what do I need to do? So I treated that exactly like a sport. And, um, you know, I remember as I was recovering, I was watching a football game on TV and a kid had a, a, a tattoo that said, uh, against all, all odds on his arm. And they talked about how he rose up from the ghetto and was helping his mom and his sister, you know, uh, you know, survive and this and that and what he did. And I thought, well, God, I'm not that guy, but against all odds is kind of a little bit about what I went through here. I shouldn't be here and I, you know, I've got this rare aggressive type of leukemia and, and I went through a bone marrow transplant. And so it, it was kind of right after I did the bone marrow transplant, you kind of, you, you know that when they bring it in, the next day you may not wake up. And one in five chance it doesn't take, your body just re rejects it. But the next day you wake up, then you wake up again and you wake up again. And during these times is when I saw that football game and I thought, wow, God, against all odds. I, I, it's kind of like me in a different way. So I wanted to give my brother that gift. Uh, like a, I wanted to like get him a ring that said against all odds. Um, so for Christmas that year, I designed a ring and my parents had it made. And so how do you say thank you to somebody that you could never repay? And so for Christmas that year, I got him the, uh, a ring that said against all odds. Inside it said brothers with the date of the transplant. And what I didn't know is my parents got me the same ring. So, you know, I, I wear that ring with my wedding band. Um, I don't have it on right now, I just took a shower. But yeah, you know, every day it's a reminder. When I think I'm having a bad day, I look down and think this isn't a bad day. This is a good day. So that transformed my kind of look, outlook on life that you know there really is no bad day every day really truly is a blessing and that's how i kind of from that point on i i realized i don't want to do anything i don't want to do in this life and so i scrapped the electric you know electrical you know dot com salesman guy and started transitioning to real estate so that's kind of where it all started and uh you know how i kind of knew i wanted to do that and i know from speaking with you in the past, when you did make that transition and you moved into the commercial real estate, you were a grinder, right? I mean, you were a guy that, that, that was not afraid to pick up a phone. You were making calls. You, 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 you had no fear. You were going to outwork everyone. Do you think that those experiences that you had mentioned, you know, uh, helped you or is that, is that just who you are and it's always who you've been? You know, it really comes back from sports, Greg. I mean, you know, sports, it's one of those things where repetition, working at your craft, when you get pushed down, getting back up. So, yeah, what I do is based upon the phone a lot. And you're going to be told no. And you just realize that, you know, they're they're not mad at you. Maybe they're having a bad day or whatever, you know. So I just would literally, the main thing with me is I take a lot of notes on my database like her dog barking in the background or, you know, he was short with me, they're going on a cruise. And then I write a thank you car card, like, hey, thank you for your time, enjoy your time in Greece. And then I would write down when they're coming back. And then I write down, hey, Bob, we talked before you left, how was Greece? And then so he doesn't remember that he wasn't nice to me on the phone, 
but he knows that like, hey, um, I just went to Greece and this guy knows me, I'll probably talk to him. So I would take a lot of notes, I would call and I realized every time I heard a no, I was that much closer to a yes. And it's truly, you know, there's, a, there's a, someone told me a story about, there's a guy in, uh, uh, in New York that sits on the street corner and he sells wallets. And when I first got in the business, I, I heard this kind of analogy and all he makes well over a million dollars a year, um, you know, drives a nice luxury car. He just holds up a wallet all day long and says, want to buy, want to buy, want to buy, want to buy. And I said, if you call enough people and say, heck, if all you say is, do you want to sell, do you want to sell, do you want to sell? You're going to reach somebody that's going to say, yeah, I'm thinking about selling. Now, obviously, there's a, a more refined way to call and say what you're going to do. But the main thing is everybody you try to meet with, you're planting a seed for future business that they may be not doing something now. But someday, all, all the seeds you planted are going are gonna to come to harvest, little by little. And if you get in front of enough people that have a large enough database that if you can keep in touch with them, then that will set you up for your whole career. So that's kind of how I did it. And um, I know it's not it's easier said than done. I mean, it's pretty easy. Get in there, make the calls, do what you say you're going to do, follow up. Uh, surprisingly enough, a lot of people have trouble with that. And that's why I love athletes that come into this business because at least they have a little bit of background of, of kind of persevering through hard times. I, I, I love that. And that's such amazing advice. And, and, you know, it's, it's not just lip service, right? It's something you did. It's something you lived through and you've, you've become extremely successful because of that. It, it, there's like so many cliches that are going through my mind. Right. I, I mean, I think about, uh, I think a Woody Allen quote, something it's like 90% of life is just showing up. And, uh, you know, or, or a, a, a goal without action is really just a dream. And, and I think, I think at the end of the day, like people just aren't willing to put in the work. And if you're just willing to put in the work and show up every single day and do your job and grind and, 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 you know, don't, don't let setbacks get you down and persevere, like success will come. You know, I mean, it, it'll come. I mean, yeah, it takes a little bit of luck and all those types of things, but I, I think you just, you know, just, just illustrated that really well in your, uh, in your last little description. So I, you know, one, one question I have, right. I, I know that USC is famous and, and very proud of the alumni network. Uh, I, I went to USC for business school and I, I, I think my very first day, my orientation, they, they talked about it. It was that core to, core to who USC is and, and, and the value of a, of a degree is that network. And, you know, what we were taught early on is when a Trojan calls, you always answer that call. It's just part of it. It's a, maybe you can't do anything to help. Maybe there's nothing you can do, but you're going to at least answer that call. How, how much did that, uh, that USC network, that, that pedigree coming from that program, coming out of that program, being a football player at that program, especially, gosh, when you were starting your professional career, that was when, you know, USC football was sort of at its apex. Was that, was, did that play a big part or was that something you were able to lean into and leverage as you got your career off the ground? You know, I'd say yes and no. And the re reason why I say that is when you call somebody up, you're not saying, hey, Greg, this is Pat Swanson. I played football at USC. You know I mean? <laughs> so they don't know anything about you. And, and, you know, I think people do business with people they like. And if had that been my approach, people wouldn't probably like me or want to work with me or anything like that. Um, but I think as you, as you meet them and get to know them and they get to know you and then they realize that, they think, wow, this is really cool. Um, I'm a fan or this and that, or you can relate stories that just comes up maybe by meeting with them and knowing they're a football fan and, you know, or finding out who their mate, who their team is. And if they're a big UCLA fan, maybe I don't mention it, you know, um, but if I, if I see USC on the, on the wall, I, I mean, heck, where, where I do business in Orange County, uh, especially the Newport Costa Mesa areas, there's a lot of SC fans and you go to their house and you see their flag up and then you'll talk about the game and then you might mention, yeah, well, I played there with such and such. And so that definitely, once you kind of get in the door, that helps move the relationship along with the right person. So I would say, yeah, it doesn't get me in the door, but once I'm in the door, it helps me elevate that a little bit. So how do you continue to stay on top of things within your, within your industry, within your role? Like how do you, you know, self-learn? How do you evolve? How do you continue to get better? 
Well, I, I think it's one of those experience our experience sort of things. You know, every deal that you do, you learn a little bit from. Um, no deal, no two deals are alike, and I, I learn something new every day. And so you kind of collect that knowledge on past deals or, you know, the way client reacts to certain things. There's other clients that have a similar personality. You kind of remember what you did on that one, how it worked out. So it's an exciting career on kind of figuring out how to put the, you know, connect the dots. So I would say that, for me, it's it's more or less kind of having that reminder of, you know, who I need to get back to, being very organized, like who I haven't talked to in a while, who's most likely to do business this year, who uh, who's looking for what. So keeping track of John Smith's looking for a 20 unit building. Oh, I've got a new one coming up. So remembering it and organizing who's looking for what and knowing who I need to get back to and who's most likely to do something this year. Um, kind of is how I stay ahead of the business. and. Yeah, a lot of it's what I call silent salesmen, sending out email blasts, social media, postcards. So those clients that aren't actually talking to you are seeing your name. So it's almost like you're talking to them without talking to them. And uh, when you follow up or when you do talk to them, oh, I get your email, I got your email last week or this and that. It's like you've been communicating with them the whole time. And I'm lucky enough to have a transaction coordinator that kind of takes a lot of stuff off my desk so I can you know, handle the business aspect of things and I've got some junior agents as well. So you know, it, it's a constant struggle of time. It's really being able to, to organize and manage your time. Absolutely, so you got your business. I know you have four kids, you're coaching. How, how do you manage your time? I mean, what's, what's, how do you manage work-life balance? <laughs> Craig, <laughs> my typical day was like today. Um, I wake up at 4.10 in the morning. I'm at the gym by 4.30 in the morning. I meet a couple friends there. Um, we work out to about 5.15. There's Starbucks in the parking lot there. I walk over to Starbucks, have Starbucks. If they're there, we chat. If not, I kind of put my headphones on. I listen to an Audible, which is anywhere from, you know, something having to do with business. I kind of mix up the Audible books of personal, like pleasure re listening um, versus like something that's gonna elevate my game like uh, I, one of the books recently was you know how to win friends and influence people which was written in the 1930s still true today so I pick up these concepts while I'm fresh my body's just clear at that time I'm having coffee and I start thinking about all the things in business where this would apply to that would apply to and I start writing myself emails about like the ideas that come to my head at that time because the best ideas that come at that time during the day and later on in the day when I'm going through my emails, I see these ideas I had at 5.45 in the morning and I'm like, oh God, I gotta follow up on that one. So, and then I forward over to like Mayella and our team who handles all our stuff, send an email to this person, send flowers to this person, do this, do that. So I, I, that starts my day there. Then the, I get home at six, from six to 7.15, it's make lunches while my wife's getting ready to go to her job. Uh, get ready, feed the dog, get the kids out the door, four kids, get them all, all to their school, dropped off, and then I get to work, and I'm usually at work, either working from home or working at, at, at in the office about 8.30, and then all the way through to about 4.30, and then we have practice at 5.30 to 7.30, then my daughter has cheer at the same location, I pick her up, go to my other son's eight o'clock practice, pick him up, come home, make dinner, settle down at nine o'clock for a glass of wine or, or a scotch or, or whatever, watch TV with my wife for an hour and I'm in bed by 10 every day. Yeah, man, busy, busy, busy guy. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you what, the Dale Carnegie book, how to, how to uh, win friends and uh, influence people. I, I get asked a lot, you know, what my favorite book is or what's a great book to read. I wouldn't say favorite, but uh, I always come back to that one. And I know it was written in the thirties and I know it's a little bit outdated, but it's really a book about human nature and psychology and just how to connect with people and what's important to people. And, and I think if you follow those lessons, they're, they're so powerful in a, in a business setting. So it's funny that you brought that up. Uh, so I got a couple questions and we can wrap things up here. So if you could go back and give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? I think I would be more humble. <laughs> I think when I was 18 years old, I was just, uh, you know, probably had a head this big and um, 
I, I, I try to always be nice to everybody and treat everybody with respect, but I, you know, I, I think that I probably would have been a lot more humble, and I think I probably just would have had a better outlook on, you know, um, treating other, well, I wouldn't say, I've always tried to treat other people the way I'd like to be treated, but maybe seeing things from another person's perspective and point of view from an early age on, I think that's stuff that you learn with age. So I just think being humble probably would have, uh, you know, kind of personally, I, I think that's something I, I could have excelled from. Who has been the most influential mentor in your life and why? You know, I, besides brother and father, I mean, that's bar none. Um, I would say probably coaches. You know, I mean, that, that's why when I coach every night, and I think of how I'm going to mold, sculpt men. Um, but I had a coach in high school, Coach Meek, and I had the junior college, uh, Gene Murphy, um, coach me. And I think part of it is they believed in me. And so I think that's really important in life is finding the people that, you know, your tribe that believes in you. Um, coach me, you know, kind of knew that, that I could go on and knew and he believed in me. And um, when I was playing at SC, you know, he, he had a day off and he was still the head coach at S Bronze and he had a day off and I didn't know, but he came up to watch my practice. And then when we were done, he took me out to dinner, just him and I, and it was just really cool. Um, and then I'd say Coach Murphy, who you know knew my dreams, knew my aspirations, put the put his team aside, and allowed me to open the doors to to leave early out of junior college to take a scholarship before going into a second season, which would have benefited him um, just to you know kind of just to be a good guy. Um, so yeah, he really helped pave the way for for me to go on to SC. Shout out to Coach Meek and Coach Murphy. What occupation other than your own would you like to try if you could? <laughs> I always wanted to be a fireman, Greg. Uh, <laughs> I still think about it. Am I, am I too old? Um, you know, I think the idea of just being around a bunch of guys, uh, hanging out, you know, making dinners, you know, saving people, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's like a sport, you know, and, and uh, it's like a fraternity house and a sport, yet you're, you know, who doesn't like firemen? So, yeah, I, I happen to coach with a couple of firemen now, and, and, you know, I hear their stories. But, you know, I wouldn't change, you know, I still wouldn't change what I do to do that. If I had another career, I would have loved to have done that. But, um, yeah, I, I'm really lucky because I, I, I just love what I do. I, I'm my own boss. I can, you know, I, 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 you can always do more. You can always do better. And I, I have extra time, you know, if I want to go coach my son's team or do whatever, I can do it. Final question. If you could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? Wow. Um, I'll, we, we went to Europe last summer um, as a family and I woke up early in, in England and my it was in London and my daughter and I walked, decided to walk and go get some coffee. We didn't know where we were going, but she was holding my hand and we passed by this massive cemetery. So we walked inside and saw thousands of gravestones. And then these were like four, four and 500 year old, you know, since they'd passed away. And, and, and some of them had like a, a, a little quote on there that said she was a, a beloved mother. Or whatever, and I started thinking, well, God, that's all. That's all this person was in life. Well, I mean, probably much more. But the people today, no one knows this person ever existed. No one knows anything about their life. And here they are. Here's their gravestone. Some guy, four hundred years, is staring at it. Who was this person? So I think it started making you think, like, God, what am I going to be in life? Is anyone going to remember me? Am I just going to be one of these gravestones that somebody walks by me four hundred years from now and says, Who is this guy? I want to be more than just, you know. Um, just was a good guy. Um, so I, I, I hope I can leave some sort of legacy behind that, you know, I, I, I would love to help people out. I'd love to be somebody that, that changed people's lives, that, you know, that tried to, you know, do the best I could to, to make someone better. I think it starts with your kids. 
Um, just being the best dad you can. I mean, if you want to change the world, you, you, you start with your own kids and, and be the best dad you can. It goes by so quick. And then everybody, and then it kind of just from there, give as much as you possibly can to everybody else. So at the end of the day, if people say, God, I, I really miss that guy. He, he, he really helped me. He really cared about me. So I, I hope that everybody I touch, I can just, like I said, spread goodness and, and try to make their life better. Um, you know, so I'm not just left as, as a one quote and everyone forgot about kind of situation. Really appreciate you coming on the show, man. Uh, it was a really fun conversation. I, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I think you had some amazing little tidbits of business, uh, of wisdom that people out there are going to hear. And I, I think that there's a lot people can take from, you know, the way you've lived your life, which you've had to overcome, how you've sort of work through obstacles, uh, chances you've taken on yourself uh, to, to get to where you've gotten to. Greg, it was awesome, man. I'd love to turn around and ask these same questions back to you. Um, we'll have to do that over a beer one of these days. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great compliment that you'd even think about me for this show. So I'm here to, you know, any, any young person coming out of college or, or just in life, I'm happy to talk to anybody and you know, try to help out wherever I can. If, if people do want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to reach you? Do you have a Twitter account, social, LinkedIn, email? Yeah, I, I, my email is just simple. It's my name, Pat, P-A-T dot Swanson, S-W-A-N-S-O-N, at Collier's, C-O-L-L-I-E-R-S dot com. We're always looking for new talent on our team. Always, I love the sports background. I mean, that's that to me is, you know, um, what is what helps make a great young broker um i passion about what i do love it love to work with young people so um yeah i'm always open